In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born to you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then, and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph, and the baby as they lay in the manger. When they had seen this, they made known the statements which had been told them about the child. And all who heard it wondered at the things which had been told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all things, pondering them in her heart. The shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as they had been told. You know, every week we... Uh, have been sharing and praying over a group of pastors and leaders of local churches, of which uh, Mike is not only a part, but uh, the leader of that. And we have to recognize in this uh, holiday season, this Christmas season, that uh, while Christmas is in front of us, uh, it's just a short distance to a new year. And 2021 is ahead and the opportunities which it holds. And so I just want to ask you to join me in prayer this morning. Uh, for these guys as they lead, because they're meeting this week, and they're being the Word, and they're going to be studying the principles about what it looks like to work together as churches to bring Christ uh, to our communities. And uh, that may seem like an easy task to some of us in the room, but it is not. It is a god size uh, desire. And so uh, we need God to work in miraculous ways as, as these guys gather, as they pray, as they study and as they seek God's will. So join me in prayer. Father, I thank you so much uh, for this day and the opportunity that we have to gather together, uh, to worship you in song, Lord, to worship you in the reading and the preaching of your word. Also, God, I give you thanks today that your Holy Spirit is here as you have promised. Uh, we've gathered in your name, and we thank you that you are present. And we pray, God, that we would feel and experience and encounter that spirit in ways that may be new and fresh for us. God, we also pray for Mike and these other leaders uh, of our communities that are uh, seeking your will and how and what it would look like to work as one uh, to bring the name of Jesus uh, to every house, uh, to every doorstep, Lord. And I pray specifically as they gather this coming week, God, that you would pour out your spirit in a powerful way, anointing them anew and afresh uh, for the work that's ahead. And God, might they get a word from you that would just be a rallying cry for them, something that they could just all uh, center their attention on as they move forward, something that would truly bind them together and unite them for your goodness and for your glory. And I, God, we're just looking forward to seeing uh, what you will do in us and through us uh, as individuals and as a church, but also as we uh, gather together, what it would look like for the body of Christ to be one uh, and for the name of Christ to be proclaimed proudly uh, throughout our cities. We love you, God, and we give thanks as we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. So several white weeks ago, uh, Mike had talked to me about the Advent series and the four topics that he wanted to, cover and wanted to cover, in the back of my mind, I'm sitting there thinking, as long as he doesn't ask me to do joy. Okay? And so when we sat down, he said, hey, I'd kind of like you to do joy. And I you know, had that heathen moment, and I'm like, oh, crap. You know? Uh, and, and there's a reason behind that. There's a history. Now, some of you know me well enough to know I would never be asked to be a poster child for joy anyway. Uh, you know, Mike, Mike talked last week about... Uh, and I, I'm putting words in his mouth, but basically people that are worried about worst case scenarios get what they deserve, you know, kind of stuff. Well, that's the world I live in. I mean, I eat, sleep, and drink worst case scenarios. I wake up thinking about worst case scenarios. I drive down the road thinking about worst case scenarios. You know, I get a hangnail on my finger and I'm afraid I'm going to get a, you know, a flesh-eating bacteria, 
kind of stuff and have a limb cut off. I mean, literally, that's the way my mind works. And it's not like I'm paranoid because I don't live my life paranoid, but I just always think about what are the, the things that could happen in any given moment. And so, a, as Mike said, you know, that, that only robs you of, G, of peace, but it also, at some level, robs you of your joy. Uh, because it's, it's hard to be joyful in a world where there are all, all many, always so many things that could potentially go wrong. Now, I will say that people like me have kept people from, like Mike from stepping in holes. Uh, you know, that's, we exist in this world uh, to keep them from walking off cliffs kind of stuff. And so, in spite of what he said, you know, in a world without us, then he would get what he deserved. Okay, so I just, I just want to say that, you know, in a public context. I was sitting there last week saying, wait a minute, I just want to step up, you know, and just say, wait a minute there. So anyway, you know, years ago I was in a meeting and somebody turned to me and said, Mark, you just need a little bit more joy. And I said, no, really, I just need a few less stupid people telling me that I need joy in my life. I mean, no, nobody, nobody knows more than I do that joy is an issue that I wrestle with. You know, and I, and I have chosen you know, to live my life through the lens of Galatians chapter 5, you know, the fruit of the Spirit. And so it's, it's not lost on me that joy is an aspect of the fruit of the Spirit, as is patient. You know, patience is in there as well. And those are two things that I struggle with. Now, in all fairness, I don't claim patience because if everybody else wasn't so stupid, I wouldn't need it, and so it wouldn't be an issue. <laughs> but the joy thing, it's kind of all on me. You know, it's, it's the way I'm wired. It's a whole nature-nurtured kind of thing that I have a worldview that just sees things that way. And so, you know, what joy is there sometimes just gets beaten back by circumstances. You know, and, I, and I've thought about moments in my life that were joyful, you know, beyond uh, when I found Christ and, and stuff like that. You know, I remember when my girls were born, each and every one of them when they were born, there was just this joy that just welled up in me. And then they became teenagers, you know, kind of stuff. And I don't know where that joy went, you know. I mean, you know, each of my grandkids that came along brought a, a whole level of joy, and now one of them is approaching teenager, you know, kind of stuff. I'm sorry, you're in the room. You've got to get talked about, okay? <laughs> your mother had to do the same thing when she was your age, just so you know that. But, you know, it's, just, it's those things. Now, here's the deal. When you're thinking about biblical joy, we have to recognize right up front that biblical joy is not circumstantial, Okay? So what we oftentimes refer to as joy is probably not true joy uh, because it, it can be taken away from us based upon whatever circumstances come next. And that's not biblical joy, really. And so we have to recognize, you know, the, the difference that exists there. You know, when you think about uh, the Christmas season, the Advent season, uh, and you think about joy, what song comes to mind for you? Joy to the what? Joy to the world. Yeah, I, I would say last service, the mass, vast majority of the people. Now, that's the way most normal people would think. You, you think joy to the world and that, you know, joy to the world, the Lord has come. Yeah, I don't. Okay? I'm like, joy to the people. In the, you know, I've got a little bit of a three-dog night into me, you know, kind of stuff going on there. Uh, I, I, anybody, anybody know who the three-dog night is in the room? Okay, anybody from the 70s? If you're from the 70s, you know for sure. If you're not, you had to learn it from somebody that had intelligence around you kind of stuff. You know, but Jeremiah was a bullfrog. I mean, it's a, it, when I think of joy to the world, that's what comes to my mind kind of stuff. And he's still a good friend of mine. But nevertheless, <laughs> uh, when you think about it and you think about this issue of Galatians chapter 5, and then also in 2 Peter chapter 1, there's a phrase in there that says, if these are yours and are increasing... And so those are two lenses that I choose to live my life through. You know, one is Galatians 5 and the fruit of the Spirit and those, those, the fruit that I see evidence of in my life and the fruit that I, I struggle with and I'm challenged with. And then this idea of these things are yours and are increasing. You know, one of the challenges of Galatians chapter 5 is you can't look at that list and grade yourself A, B, C, or D based upon how many you got and how many you don't. You know, the fruit of the Spirit is a collective it's, it's not components, it's collective. And so if you, if you don't have one, there's evidence there that there is something in your life that you haven't yet given over to God. And that's what we want to wrestle with today. How many people in this room would just say joy is how you are face forward in the world? You know, okay, there, there's a handful of there. And everybody else in the room is saying, yeah, I don't think so. Okay, because that's the way we see the world. You know, 
you know, if there's a zombie apocalypse, all of you that are joy face forward, you're dead. We are going to trample you on the way to the door. That's, the, that's just the reality of it, you know, kind of stuff. And, and so most of us are living with this issue of, man, if the word of God tells me that I need to have joy, then what do I need to do differently so that joy is a part of my life? And that's what we want to look at today, is how do we find joy? And sometimes it's remembering what brought us joy that doesn't ebb and flow in seasons and circumstances and the like. And so just thinking about it. So one of the things is sometimes how we define the word. So two weeks ago, Doug talked about hope. Right? And so he, he preached on hope. And what we have to recognize is that with every one of these words, there is a modern American alternative that's a false expression. So you might, you hear the word hope and you think wish. You know, and, and you wish for something and you, you really want it to have bad. And you say that, so it's not really hope. Okay, because hope is always, hope, biblical hope, is always based in something that is unfailing. And so if I hope for something and it may or may not happen, then it's not true biblical hope. It's a wish. We're wishing that something will happen. But biblical hope is based upon promise. And God is faithful to his promise. And so we have to recognize that sometimes what we call hope is not hope. It's a wish. But when we set ourselves in a place where we really receive hope as God has promised it to us, then our lives look differently. And then last week, Mike talked about peace. Okay, and again, there's an alternative because many times the opposite for us of peace is, is the idea of war. And so we think of peace as the absence of war. In our personal context, peace would be the absence of trials and tribulations and struggles. But that's not the biblical example. In fact, the Bible is very clear that what we need is a kind of peace that exists in spite of the circumstances around us. And that's just not a peace you go out, wake up one day and say, you know what, I'm going to have peace like the Bible describes it. No, God has to give it. It's a gift that is given to us. But in order for us to align ourselves with God and to receive his gift, there is a certain way we have to see the world that may be different than nature and nurture has created us to see it. And that's what the word of God does is it reshapes our worldview and allows us to see things just a little bit differently. And the same is going to be true this week with joy. Joy is not the same as happiness. You know, joy is not the same as elation. And how do I know that? Because any of those things can change with circumstances. Now, I recognize that I'm a little bit on the extreme side of this. You know, I, I've had experiences over 40 years of ministry where I've gone to church and I've been up here spiritually. And somebody will walk up to me and they'll have something to be critical about. They'll be angry about something. And I'm down here. You know, it's like Chicken Little, the world has now fallen, kind of stuff. And how could I be up here in one moment and one criticism, one unkind word can bring me down there? Okay. That's because that, that wasn't joy that I was experiencing. I was just having a good moment. Okay. And we need to move to that place, not that we don't have good moments, those are all fine, we're always going to experience those, where circumstantially something happens, and that was good, that felt good. But if it's true joy, no one can take it away from us. Nothing can take it away from us. There's no circumstance, there's no situation, there's no person, there's nothing that can take it away from us. That in any given circumstance, I still have joy. Because it's not rooted in external things. It's rooted in God's gift, his indwelling Holy Spirit that is promised to me. And so that's what we want to look at, and that's what we want to, to get to. Now, some of you are like, man, th this is too much work for me. I get it. Okay, take a nap. Read a book, you know, get on your internet, play a game, just turn off the volume kind of stuff. Because if you don't care to get there, then my 40 years of struggle won't mean anything to you. Because okay? it has literally been a 40-year struggle. Now, it's probably been longer than that, but it's only been 40 years that I've been aware of the fact that I'm held to a standard as a Christian that I wasn't able to live up to. And I would, we met with, a, Gloria and I met with a couple this week that was having some marital problems. And it's like, you need to understand something. We've been married almost 40 years, and we still wrestle with this. We still struggle with this. Now, you can look at that and say, oh, man, what hope is there for me? Or you can look at it and say, praise the Lord, somebody else is struggling like I am. You know, because for me, as long as I have breath, I have hope. That is another way that I've lived my life. I do not like where I am. 
I recognize that I ought to have more joy, and in most circumstances, I probably ought to have more patience, although that's, again, more on you than it is me, okay? But I need to recognize every day this is something I need to look at because what it tells me is not that I need to work on my joy, but I need to work on my relationship with my God because I can't manufacture joy. It's not possible for me to manufacture joy. You know, it's, it's not like you can, you can do something and you can, you know, modify my behavior, you know, hook me up to electrodes, and every time I put a frown on my face, you give me a jolt. It's like, and then it stops. That, wasn't a, that was not joy, that was a grimace. You know, so you can't change that behavior. But I can allow God to do a work in me that changes my heart by reminding me of certain things because I have experienced joy. I have experienced joy. There have been seasons in my life where God has done something that is taking me exponentially from here to there. And those were moments of joy. You know, when I came, when I moved from being lost to being found, that was a moment of joy. You know, when I experienced deliverance, that was a moment of joy. You know, when I had an experience of, of calling and God reshaping me to do the work that he called me to do, it was a moment of joy. But I have to remember those and look for the new ones. Because too many times our joy is just rooted in something in the past. And it, at least in my experiences, the power of that to create joy in me wanes. And honestly, people sometimes don't want to hear your story that's 20 years old because they want to know what's God doing in your life today how is God reshaping you today how are you wrestling today I can assure you nobody wants to hear in 40 years you're going to be just like you were yesterday okay that's not what anybody wants to hear because that's not even my case you know, I probably sell myself a little bit short but the reality is I know if I look at those lists joy is an issue I wrestle with because of how I'm wired and so if you're with me, then kind of join me on a little bit of that journey because it is something I struggle with. But I also know that this thing is not circumstantial and it can allow me in any given circumstance to see the goodness of my God. And that's what we're looking for here. You know, the Advent. You think, you think in Luke chapter 2. You got a virgin girl who's in all likelihood being married to an older man. And she gets a visit. And she's told, hey, you're going to bear a child. Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. And what did she experience? Joy. You know, you, you have a priest that goes in to serve the, the table and he gets a visit and finds out he's going to have a son in old age. What did he experience? Joy. You know, you, 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 the, the Christmas story also tells of these three magi that came from the east, you know, and, and they came and they had an experience of joy and they bowed down and worshiped. But then you get this, in our story today, you have these shepherds who are out on a hill just like they were every, they didn't have Saturdays and Sundays off, just like they were every day of their life. They worked, they ate, they slept, and they started over again. And yet this night was different. They're sitting on the side of the hill. It's at night. The sheep are bedded down. They're basically just watching, keeping guard over the sheep. And they get a visit. And they're told, they're described the joy of the message. It says, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. Now, you, you listen to that story, and we've heard it so many times that we sometimes lose sight of the power of it. These guys had one job, and that's to watch sheep. And what did they do? They left their sheep. Why? Because something more important than sheep had been shown to them. And nothing was going to keep them from seeing what had been promised. And so they went and they found a mother and a father and a child and they shared what the angels had told them. And they just went away with joy because of what they'd experienced. You know, it's interesting, we, we talk about this, and I even did last hour. You know, these guys as, as shepherds were some of the lowest class in the culture. 
you know, you, you didn't typically choose to be a shepherd. You, if you were a shepherd, it was because it was the only job available to you and you were working for somebody else or it's what grandpa did and it's what dad did and you didn't know anything else and so you did that. But you always aspired for something else. And yet these guys found joy. Or better yet, joy found them. And they had this experience that we can only assume forever change them. What's interesting about this story is they left, they go back to the Bethlehem hillside, and we don't hear about them again, you know, kind of stuff. But their life was forever changed from the experience they had. And everyone in this room who's experienced the goodness of God has a life that has been forever changed. But sometimes time and distance and experience of life can cause that memory to wane. And in order for us to be a catalyst in the world around us, that needs to be rekindled in every one of us. Because going to work, raising a family, working on our homes is not the meaning of life. Jesus is. And there are people in your sphere that will never hear, or if they hear, will never believe unless they hear your story. Because it's your story that will change the way they see the world. My contention is, is that many of us do not share our faith stories because we have lost sight of what happened when we found faith. Because I believe if we were rooted in that memory of what God had done for us, we couldn't help but tell others that story. Because we would want that for them. Don't you want good for people that you care about? And so why would we not share that good news? You know, in Philippians chapter 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. In First Thessalonians, it repeats that. And it says, Rejoice always. Now again, for somebody like me, those are passages of Scripture that I sometimes hate, not for the whole thing. It's that little world, always. Always. Because I can do it occasionally. You know, I, I, occasionally I can get there. Circumstantially. But what does it look like to live my life under the power of the Holy Spirit? And to have that kind of joy that is not just affecting how I live, but it effervesces up out of me so that I can share it with people around me. You know, I, I have a, a friend that used to talk about Christians who were weaned on pickles. You know, and that just basically meant that sour look you get when you suck a, a pickle kind of thing. And he says, you know, you look at too many Christians and you see nothing in their expression that anyone else would want. You see nothing that would attract someone to say, man, what have you got that I need? You hear nothing come out of their mouths except the same things you hear out of everyone else in the world. And when we think about this Advent season, all four of these topics are things that ought to be so present in our lives that they overflow out of us and other people want what we have. You know, one of the things when you, when you look at uh, both the Old and the New Testament and all of the verses that reference joy... Uh, one of the things that I found in there is that with almost complete certainty, every time there is a reference to joy, there is a reference to song, there is a reference to noise, and there is a reference to shout. Now what that tells me is that when you think about the biblical concept of joy, it is something that just has to express itself. Now, it may express itself long-term in many different ways, but it just has to get out. And sometimes it's like, ha! You know, there's just that noise that has to come out of us because that experience is so powerful. It's so palpable that if it stayed in, it would destroy us. How long has it been since you've had that kind of joy in your life? Since it was just so strong, it was so powerful that it had to get out. And if it's been a long time, what does it look like 
to rekindle that. In 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 9, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this... You greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him, and though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible, and full glory. See, if there is no joy effervescent in us, we have forgotten what God has done for us. Now, I don't know about you, and I've told you my story before. There's no point to tell it again. But what God did for me was nothing short of miraculous. You know, you don't go to bed drunk and high, smoking two packs of cigarettes a day, and wake up clean and sober and never smoke again by your own. That's not, a, that's not an act of will. That's an act of God. And yet there are times where I look back on that and it's almost somebody else's story because it was so long ago. And you look, you look and it's like, you know, what God did was amazing. And there have been times since where God has done amazing things. And if God is not doing amazing things now, it's because I am not making myself available for God to do amazing things. Because I'm allowing the circumstances and the situation of my present life and lifestyle to beat back the joy that by his Holy Spirit, God has promised me. And that may be true of you as well. It may be true of you as well. Because when we're looking at this, the reality is this kind of joy cannot be mimicked. You know, you, 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 some people can do the, the, you know, the selfies where they do the natural smile every time. I can't. You know, it looks like somebody pinched me when I try to do that. You know, it's like I literally have to be made to laugh before I can smile naturally for a camera. Okay, literally. Or it just looks like I'm in pain. I'm grimacing kind of stuff. Now, some people can do that, but this kind of joy you cannot mimic. It can't be created artificially. It can't be learned. You can't sit down with somebody that has joy and says, teach me how to be joyful. You know, it's just not possible for them because you two don't speak the same language. You know, it's like, you know, Mike and, have a lot of, Mike and I have a lot of things in common, but when it comes to the worldview about things, we just don't speak the same language. In his opinion, if I saw the world like him, the world would be a better place. The problem with that is, that I already know if he saw it like me, the world would be a better place. And so I can't teach you joy. I couldn't teach you joy under the best of circumstances. But someone that is, has that kind of joy that just enters the room and you see it, they can't teach that to you. They can't give it to you. Because it has to be found somewhere else. It has to be rooted in something else. It requires a change of our hearts. Because remember, Galatians chapter 5 said it is the fruit of the Spirit. It's the evidence of the Spirit in you. And if there is no evidence of fruit in your life, it's not because God has failed you. It's not because God has come up short. It's not because he's withheld from you. It's not because he hasn't chosen you. It's because you haven't chosen him. It's because you haven't submitted to him. It's because you have not given everything over to him. And so I just want, I want you to think here for just a couple minutes and just kind of set your mind on what it would look like to begin making yourself available for God to do a work in you that would create joy. Now, at some level, there's this part of me that wishes everyone in this room 
could just be overwhelmed by joy. Absolutely overwhelmed. I think they call that slain in the spirit, maybe. I don't know. But I just wish you'd be overwhelmed by joy. There's this other part of my flesh that wishes you wouldn't. Because then I'd have to ask, what happened over the last 40 years with me? I, I, I really want you to suffer with me just a little bit in this whole process. So I, I've got this tension. You know, I've got this little guy on this shoulder saying one thing, a little guy on their shoulder saying the other thing. But the reality is, Scripture is true. And so if it is true, and we believe, then we have to find a way to live in that truth. And to receive all the promises of God. And when we read 1 Peter chapter 1, it tells us that our joy comes from our salvation. Our joy comes from what God did for us. Our joy comes by God coming in the flesh as Jesus Christ, not just living a life, but dying a life. And being raised from the dead and coming back. And being in a place where on this day... We could say yes to Christ. And things change. Now, sometimes they change exponentially. You go to bed one way and you wake up another. Sometimes it's just that little thing that starts to grow in you. That gets flickered into a flame. And all of a sudden you recognize the person I was then is not the person I am now. They're both right. They're both of God. Some of us are just a little bit more hard sell on it. And have to move into it. So I want you to think about these things. You will know that you have true biblical joy when you can find contentment in every moment. You will know that you have found true joy when you can find contentment in every moment. Where circumstances and situations cannot change the way you see the world that God has ordained for you. You know, that, that one person walking in the room doesn't all of a sudden make you go, eh, this is going to be a terrible day. You know, it always amazes me. Some of us go into holidays recognizing that there's going to be somebody there that's going to ruin our day. Like, why would you do that? I don't understand that. <clears throat> I meet with some guys every Thursday morning. And one of them, it's just like every year, you get around the holidays, I have to listen to him say, oh, I, you know, I have to deal with this person. I, I said, then don't go. He's like, what? I said, don't go. Well, I can't not go. I said, well, then shut up. <laughs> One of the two, you know. <laughs> My patience was coming out in that moment. You know, it's like, <laughs> either don't go or shut up. Because every year it's the same thing. You're going to have to deal with those people. Have a holiday at your house and don't invite them. I don't care. But you, what's, what's the definition of insanity? Continuing to do the same things and expecting a different result. We cannot do the same thing. So we have to get to that place where circumstances and situations cannot take away our joy. And if they can, it's not joy. So that no matter what I'm facing, whatever tomorrow looks like for you, and for, for some of you, you're wired like me, you're already thinking about tomorrow. Whatever tomorrow holds for you, it cannot rob you of the joy that the Holy Spirit has placed within you because of what God has done for you, not because of anything other than what God has done for you. You have a hope that the world doesn't have because of Jesus Christ. That ought to affect the way we see it. You'll know that you have joy when you don't need the future to be better than today. Okay? If you need the future to be better than today, then you're not going to have joy because in most cases, the future isn't better. Troubles pass. Things change. But for those of you that are living for a better future, your better future is today. And it's found in Christ. And so you'll know that you have that kind of joy when you're not thinking about a future. It's like, you know what? Today is good. I have so much to be thankful for. So much. And it's unmeasurable. But even if God took all that away from me, I should still be able to find joy. You know, there are times I look at the world and it's like, you know, because I struggle with this so much, I feel like God needs to change the way things operate. Any of you, any of you guys think you're the center of the universe? Okay, all right. And if not, any of you think the spouse sitting next to you thinks they're the center of the universe? Okay, yeah, a lot more laughter there. I know how this works. You know, it's like, but it's like, I need God to change this. Then I have this Job moment. Where were you where I set the constellations in place? Where were you when I created this? 
you know, and, and recognizing that, uh, you know, the world does not revolve around me. Now, even saying that out loud causes me a little concern. You know, I'm an only child. My wife will tell you the world does revolve around me, okay? But just hearing that, but recognizing that I don't need a better future. My today is good, not just good enough. My today is good. I have a lot to be thankful for, not the least of which is the fact that Jesus died for me and I have hope. And third, you'll know that joy is growing in you when you can see the God potential in every circumstance. Where this thing coming at me isn't something to be overcome or endured, but it is something to find how God is going to use it. That's where joy grows. That's where that gives God that opportunity to, to just turn up the heat a little bit in that area of our lives where before it was always getting turned back. But now God can turn it up and we can begin to, to see the world differently and to give thanks. And I, I want to encourage you today for everyone in this room who claims Christ. I just want to ask you how much joy is there in your life related to what he's done for you? How much joy is there for the sacrifice he's made, for the opportunities he's given, and for the hope that you have? And if you don't, if you don't have Christ in your life, okay, I hope this hasn't been a discouragement to you, <laughs> that it's a journey, it's a struggle. But God will take away from you that which nobody else can, and that is the punishment for your sin. And that is your starting point. God takes that away and he gives you a hope for tomorrow that you did not have before. You were just stumbling one foot and forward one day to the next and God wants to lift you up and give your life meaning and purpose. And as Mike said, that's what 2021 is going to be about. It's helping you to understand based upon how God has created you what your meaning and your purpose is so that we can all be something more together. Pray with me, if you will. Father, thank you for your faithfulness, God. And I, I know there's many uh, people on the journey with me uh, who could recognize and identify with the struggles. And it may just be joy. It may be something else. It may be peace or patience or anything else in there that just recognize with. And sometimes we just give up because those things seem so far away from us. But God, you never gave up on us. And I pray that you would just remind us of the joy that we had in our lives because you pulled us up out of our sin and gave us hope. God, I pray that as we continue into our Advent season, uh, God, that we would be looking for you and, and giving you praise and glory and honor uh, as you prepare us for 2021 and what we might do in it for your glory. We love you, God, and we give thanks in Christ's name. Amen.